Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You don't need to start early. You just need to be sure when you start, you're ready to start right. There's all kinds of people that have a gift that would take them somewhere, but no character to keep them there once they get there. I'm going to use an analogy. I used it a little bit last night, but I'm going to use it a lot more tonight and even more tomorrow about pregnancy. We need to be pregnant in the spirit. See, so this is the time when men can get pregnant. Because we need to be pregnant in the spirit with the dreams and the visions and the hopes and the ideas that God puts on the inside of us. There's a lot going on inside of a pregnant woman. <laughs> so if you've got a call, a dream, a vision, a goal, a plan, and you act a little weird once in a while in the midst of carrying it around, <laughs> just tell people, I'm sorry I'm acting weird, I'm pregnant. Come on, how many of you are pregnant with something? Even you guys, how many of you are pregnant with something? Yay, the men are pregnant. Woo, hallelujah. I just remember how miserable I would be. I just like, I felt like I, could, I, didn't, have a, I didn't have a place anymore at church. And I'll never forget when God said to me, Joyce, I am your place. If you know who you are in me, you can be comfortable anywhere at any time. You can sit in the back. You can sit in the front. You can park in the front. You can park in the back. You can be included. You don't have to be included. You can know. You don't have to know because none of that makes you who you are. You are who you are because you're in me. And I also had to go through a lot of things. And I see a lot of young people here tonight, a lot of young girls and, and, and young men and and teenagers, and I just like to say something to you specifically, but the adults will get blessed by it too. One of the things that you have to learn, I believe with all my heart, before God can use you effectively, is that you have to be your own person. You don't, you cannot be somebody else. God is not ever going to help you be somebody else. Don't you sit out there, if you've got a great singing voice and want to be a worship leader and say, I want to be the next Darlene Check." Because she's one of a kind, I'm one of a kind, you're one of a kind, and all you do is sell yourself short when you decide you want to be somebody else. Now, people can be an example to you, but they can't be your standard. Amen? Don't ever want to be just like somebody else. Want to be better than them. Elisha had double the anointing that Elijah had. But something that you're going to have to do is learn how to be you. And I can just tell you that I am not a normal woman. I mean, I just never was. And I'm not. And I finally had to get used to a new normal. I'm normal, but not normal like other people would be normal. To be honest with you, you can't do what I'm doing and just be like everybody else. And so I always felt a sense of detachment and, and, and a little bit of loneliness and You know, like I wasn't quite sure where I fit. And some of that came from the way that I was raised. But part of it just came from the fact that God had called me out to do something. And so people, a lot of times, would, they didn't understand me. And they thought I was strange. And, well, why don't you want to do that? And, 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 you know, I just, it took me a long time. But I'm just telling all you young people, don't live under the peer pressure of what other people expect and want you to do. Right now, early, you need to say, I am going to be who and what God wants me to be, and I don't care who likes it or who don't. I don't have to look like you. I don't have to talk like you. I don't have to like what you like. I don't have to go where you go. You either accept me for me, or you can do without me. Do not let people manipulate you and control you to have their friendship. If you buy a friend through letting them control you, you'll have to do the same thing to keep them all your life. Got hundreds of stories I could tell you about that, but I got to try to press on here. The point is, is that preparation takes a long time. 
And so God has got something ready for you. I'm telling you, I promise you, God has got something ready for you. It's ready. It's finished. It's done. It's waiting. But now he's getting you ready for the thing that he's got ready for you. Now, I know you think you're ready. But I can tell you right now, when you're ready, when you're ready, the baby will come. Any woman knows when they get ready to come, they come. Amen? I hope you get here tomorrow, too, because it's great to conceive and get pregnant, but i got to talk to you a little bit tomorrow about labor and delivery. Tonight we're going to talk about pregnancy, but tomorrow we've got to talk about labor and delivery. <laughs> so tie your seatbelt when you come in tomorrow and get ready. Your goal may be right, but your timing could be way off. Pregnancy is uncomfortable. Now, pregnancy is kind of a private thing. Have you ever noticed that this thing that God's farming in a woman is not on this clear plastic sack outside of her body so everybody can see it? And I just want to make something out of that because there's things that God's doing in you that are quite private, really none of anybody's business, and nothing that anybody else would understand anyway. And even when we try to share our dreams and visions and goals with other people, many times all they do is discourage us because God didn't tell them what he told us. You see a little girl that weighs about 100 pounds and she says, oh, I'm pregnant. And the first thing you think is, well, you sure don't look pregnant. Well, when I told people that God had called me to preach, they were like, what? Well, you don't have the personality for that. You can't do that. You're a woman. And so all it did was discourage me. Too often we're wanting to tell everybody all this stuff that's going on in us, and we need to just keep it between us and God and just wait till it's time to give birth and let the whole world see the evidence. Come on. Okay, now, I want you to get the next few minutes of this message because to me, when I found this out, it explained so much to me. There's something that we find in the Bible that I call the silent years. And they're the years between when you've got this goal, this dream, this vision, this hope. And now you're just here pregnant. <laughs> and you got all this stuff going on inside you and you don't understand. And, you know, you're starting to feel a You know, a, a pregnant woman, sometimes she just... She almost feels like a separation because now she likes to be around other pregnant people. There's nothing better for somebody that's pregnant with a dream and a vision than to be around somebody else that's pregnant with a dream and a vision. And so many times even when you're pregnant with something from God, it'll be like a time of separation in your life. God has to get you comfortable with not being involved in everything that you used to be involved in. Well, Jesus is our greatest example of everything, and we're going to go to the book of Luke. And I want to show you something that to me is very profound. I pray right now in Jesus' name that you'll get out of this what I did. In Luke chapter 2, verse 22, it says, And when the time for their purification, the mother's purification and the baby's dedication came, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. He was eight days old. Jesus was eight days old. When he was dedicated to the Lord. Now, we do not hear one other thing about Jesus. There's not another thing recorded about him in the Bible until he was 12 years old. And let's just look what it says about him. Verse 39, and when they had done everything according to the law of the Lord, they went back to Galilee, to their own town, Nazareth, and the child grew. That's all that happened in 12 years. <laughs> I'm going to show you in a minute. The next time you see him, when he was 12, then they took him to the temple. And he didn't go home with them. And he was there teaching people. And they left without him thinking he was with them. And 
came back and really chastised him. Son, how could you do this to us? And he said, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? Well, you know, even Jesus, I guess, got a little bit ahead of himself because they took him home for another 18 years. <laughs> so even though he thought he must be about his father's business, he got yanked up by the nap of the neck, I guess, and taken home and got, you know, son, how could you do that to us? The only thing that the Bible says about him from the time he was eight days old to 12 years is he grew. <laughs> the only thing it says about him from the time that he was 12 until 30 when he came out for this public ministry was he grew. Well, I guess you don't get it if you haven't been there. But let me tell you something, I get it. Just those two words, he grew, are some of the most painful words that you can ever hear in your life. Growing up spiritually is not easy. It is not easy to let go of all the things that God wants you to let go of to die to self, to learn how to come under authority, to learn how to be obedient, to learn you can't live by your plan, and so on and so forth. It's not easy. It was so hard for me to learn how to trust men because I'd always been mistreated by men. And it was so hard for me to come under male authority because I'd always been mistreated by men. And I remember so many of the things that I went through and the situations and the circumstances that God would set up for me and he was not going to let me get away from it any way, no how. He grew. And the Bible says, and he became strong in spirit. I love that. He grew and he became strong in spirit. Let's look at verses uh, 41 and 42, Luke chapter 2, 41 and 42. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year to the Passover feast, and when he was 12, they went up as was their custom, and it goes on and on and tells you, you know, quite a bit, and we'll just skip to the end here to save time, verse 51 and 52, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was habitually obedient to them, and his mother kept and closely, persistently guarded all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom, he increased, he grew in wisdom, in broad and full understanding, and in stature and years, and he grew in favor with God and man. I, I just find it so interesting. I don't know if anybody else does it. Here we have Jesus, eight days old, 12 years. We hear nothing except he grew. <laughs> 18 years, we hear nothing except he grew. But when he came out of there, a three-year ministry is still impacting the whole earth. You know why? Because he was prepared. He was ready. He waited till the right time. And he came out full of the Holy Ghost. And what a powerful three-year ministry. You don't need to start early. You just need to be sure when you start, you're ready to start right. There's all kinds of people that have a gift that would take them somewhere, but no character to keep them there once they get there. You not only need charisma, you need character. 30 years of preparation for a three-year ministry. I love to talk to somebody sometimes that's, that's made the journey and is living in the fulfillment now of what they believe for. It's like we can talk on a level where you don't even have to explain things to people. You're just like, I, I get it. <laughs> I know. It's like there's a silent communication between you. It's like, you know, Darlene and I understand each other, both women in ministry both in a time, maybe me a little more than her because I'm older than her, when it wasn't popular to be a woman in ministry. And I know, I know what it takes to get to the end. Pastor Paul was sharing a few things with me today about how he had to lay down his doctoring skills when God spoke to him to come here and serve. 
He was a well-known surgeon, and God said, lay it down and just go serve. And he thought he'd lost all of his skills, and so for eight years he just served, and then God gave it back, double. You know, God may ask you to put down your rod like he asked Moses to throw his rod down, but then when Moses picked his rod back up, it was full of God's power. Before that, it was just a plain old rod. Now it was the rod of God. If I could even just begin to tell you how miserable I used to be and how happy I am now. Do I have rough days? Yes. Do I get tired? Yes. I've been doing this a long time. But to be able to help people, to be able to hear somebody say, your teaching changed my life. Let me tell you something. It is so worth anything that you have to give up to do what God wants you to do. And here again, it doesn't have to be a ministry thing. Be the greatest mom that the earth ever saw. Be the greatest wife that's ever been known. Whatever you're going to do, do it the very best that you can do it. Silent years. I remember when I came on the scene, kind of like, you know, God brought me out. And uh, I was starting to get invited to meetings and was on quite a few radio stations then. And I remember somebody saying to me one night after I preached, where did you come from? We never heard of you. Your teaching is great. Where did you come from? I thought, well, I've been somewhere, but it was nowhere you would have wanted to have been. <laughs> Amen? Now, John the Baptist was born, and he was told, his mother was told, this child is going to be a great child, and is going to be the forerunner for Jesus. What an awesome call, opportunity. And then it goes right on and says... And he went into the wilderness. Come on now. He went into the wilderness and stayed there until God called him out to go start announcing, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 30 years he lived in that wilderness. Let me tell you something about the wilderness and the valley. We all want the mountaintop, and that's great. But you know, when you get to the mountaintop, I don't know if you've ever noticed but nothing grows on mountaintops. Come on now, there's a message here. I'll tell you what you get on a mountaintop. You see the next mountaintop you need to get to. That's all you see. I'm telling you what, it just used to aggravate me. And I finally got it. It's like, praise God. I did it. And then three days later, I'd be like, God would be calling me to something else. And I'm like, oh, leave me alone, will you? <laughs> now I got to feed a million kids. And you know, why can't I just feed the ones I'm feeding? And, you know, why do I have to start an office in Germany? And, you know, come on, how many of you know? But see, we need that. We have to be reaching. We have to be growing. Think for a minute. When you get to the mountaintop, all you see is the next mountain that you got to get to. There's really nothing growing up there. you got good view, but there's nothing growing. And the only way you can get to that next mountain, come on now, you got to go back down into the valley. <laughs> Woo! you got to go back down into the valley where everything is lush and green and growing and beautiful. And then you start climbing up that next mountain. Just so you can get to the top and see the next one you got to try to get to. God told me many years ago, all your life, all your life, as soon as you reach one goal, there'll be another one out in front of you. <laughs> Come on, some of you are going, like, <laughs> but that's what we're created for. You don't want to just be static and do nothing. We usually have a meeting on Friday morning in our conferences, but, but we're not able to when we come here because of the parking situation. And so I had all day to do nothing today. And I was so tired. I mean, I yawned until 1 o'clock this afternoon. And I kept telling them, I don't know what's the matter with me. I am so tired. 
He said, you're only like that because you're not doing anything. He said, we were getting ready to go to lunch with the people. He said, you wait. You wait till you get to lunch and you get interested in something. It'll all go away. Sure enough, it wasn't 10 minutes. And I was like, <laughs> we got to do something. It's for our own good that we have something to reach for and something to, to go for. Amen? And we all think, oh, if I just didn't have to do anything. The Bible's full of people who had what I call these silent years. Moses was hidden three months by his mother, and then he spent 40 years hidden on the backside of the desert, getting prepared for what God called him to do. Maybe you don't have it so tough after all. Moses had a call, but nobody even knew where he was, except God. Joseph spent 13 years in prison for something he did not do because he had a dream. The devil's a dream thief. He'll try to kill your dreams. He'll try to get you to abort them. He'll try to get you to birth them early so they'll be weak and sickly. Come on now. David spent a lot of lonely nights tending sheep as a youth. He was anointed to be king and taken to Saul's house to play music for him. But Saul became jealous and hated him. We're going to talk about some of that a little bit tomorrow. It's so disheartening when you have something in you that you believe God gave you and the only thing you get from people is discouragement and jealousy. How many of you think we ought to talk about that tomorrow? You just want somebody to be proud of you. And all you get is jealousy, and judgment, and criticism. Not from everybody, but you do have to deal with some of that. And you'll never make it to the end if you don't know how to deal with it. You're going to get your Judas kiss, and you have to know how to go on. Saul kept trying to kill David, repeatedly trying to kill him. And David was just a sweet guy that wanted to sing his songs and play his thing and... You know, he never asked to be king. <laughs> I try to remind God sometimes, I didn't call myself, you did this. So you're stuck with me. You knew what you were getting when you got me. Well, when, 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 when? Suddenly. I love that word suddenly. And it's also all over the Bible. When do you give birth? Suddenly. I pray that God would anoint each of you specially to make it all the way through to the end. I pray that not one person that's hearing my voice right now will fail to finish their race. Not one. I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. The truth of God's Word has been preached here tonight, and you are not going to steal it from people. They are going to see the fulfillment of their dreams and visions, their gold, their ideas that God has placed in them. And they are not quitters and they are not going to give up. No matter how long it takes, they will give birth in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody give God praise. Well, today we've talked about the silent years, and I'm sure that many of you think you're in the midst of them right now. And that's a time in your life when you have something in your heart that you really believe is going to happen, something that maybe you believe God wants you to do or something you believe that you're supposed to do, a goal, a dream, a vision, but it's not happening yet. And those can be really, really frustrating times. But, you know, just because God wants to do something with you doesn't mean that there's nothing for him to do in you. I always like to say that before God can do something through you, he has to do something to you. At least that was my experience. So I want to encourage you, take time to grow, to develop godly character, and listen to God. You know, the top of the mountain is not where you grow. We all like that place. But where we really grow is in the valley. We always grow when we choose to do the right thing when it doesn't feel good yet. In the midst of waiting on God, have a really expectant attitude and just expect God to move suddenly. Every day you can get up and say, something good is going to happen to me today. 
Why don't you try that and just see how much better you feel? Tomorrow when you get up, don't even wait till tomorrow. Just say it as soon as this program's over. Why don't you say it five times today? Something good is going to happen to me.